Well, it is on. Good. 10 o'clock by my watch. That's me. 10 o'clock by my watch, so that means we're going to start. If your watch doesn't agree. Mm. <laughs> Good morning, Dick. Good morning. You want to poke the doors closed? Welcome to all of you. I'm glad to see such a nice turnout that I think is a reflection uh, on our guest speaker. Uh, but many of you are also Veterans Committee members, and I'm glad for your presence as well. Uh, we're going to use the same routine that we did in the past. We'll start out with the uh, call to order, and then a short prayer, and then a pledge to allegiance. And then Bob Legal is going to introduce Steve, our guest speaker. The meeting will be divided into two parts. The first part will be the guest speaker approximately 30 minutes with Q&A in there, and then 30 minutes of business, lots of business. So <laughs> strap on your socks and your backpack. Okay, questions before we start? Great, the meeting is called to order. And if you would, those who are able, stand for the prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name with grateful hearts for all that you do for us each and every day. We take so for granted this wonderful country in which we live, this wonderful Merrimack Bluffs and all the people who make it work so that we can live in comfort. Bless each of them and their families, keep them strong in the word and strong in your support. We ask you uh, to bless all of our family members wherever they may be and keep them just as you did for us as our growing up years and watching us grow into our older years. Be with us now. We need you each day. Amen. We ask you to join the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Take your seats, please. Robert, you're up. Oops, sorry. Oh, that's a little... That's supposed to slip right over that. And it cuts down on the air, air molecules. This is still on, right? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I was going to use this one for now. Let's use both. I'm in stereo? It's on the, it's on the, I got you. I'll use this one. <laughs> Good morning. Am I coming through? I'm using this one now. Ah. I'm not this coordinated. <laughs> Tell me again how it's done. Okay. Um, I first met Steve, who goes, call sign is Bull. His last name is Schmidt. You can figure it out for yourself. In 2000, when he arrived at Boeing St. Louis and qualified as a customer flight production flight acceptance test pilot for the F-18 and F-15 series aircraft and the T-45C U.S. Navy training aircraft. Bull was a great customer pilot, skilled, thorough, and a pleasure to work with. In two, 2004, Bull, Bull got smart and retired and came to work for Boeing. We were, so we were able to retain a proven outstanding pilot as a contractor test pilot. In this role, he supported numerous Boeing aircraft programs and projects. Steve later joined the Boeing U.S. Air Force TX program and became a valued member of the TX team responsible for the management and execution of the engineering and manufacturing development flight test activity on the TX. So that brings us to today. And so please welcome Bull Schmidt, Chief Test Pilot for the Boeing T-7A Red Hawk Air Force Trainer. That's a mouthful. Both. Both. All right. Um, thank you, Bob. Is there a clip on this thing? Yeah, there is. Okay. It's down uh, there. It's slid oh. down on that. Oh. Whoops. Okay. There we go. All right. Right. 
Oh, again. But it's okay. okay. And then I can work. just hold this if you... Oh, yeah. There you go. Perfect. You're perfect. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you. I'm um, happy to be here. Um, it's been a while since I've seen Bob, and when he emailed me and asked me if I wanted to um, give a presentation, uh, I said, sure. Uh, if he includes a free lunch, um, that would be great. <laughs> so, but, uh, so anyway, uh, like you said, uh, Steve Bullschmidt uh, has been my call sign uh, since I started flying in the Navy. This picture here is a uh, Super Hornet. Um, it's at the uh, 2012 Farnborough International Air Show over in England, so which uh, that is me in the airplane. Um, I usually only use pictures that I'm flying, but there are some in here that I'm not in, um, but, but a lot of them I, I am. So um, when I put this presentation together, I decided I was going to use uh, a few word as, words as possible on the charts, so you won't have to read much. I use pictures, and I'll, and I'll talk uh, and amplify as we go through. So. Um, uh, in any case, if you got questions, uh, we certainly take them at the end. If something needs to be asked right away, you know, raise your hand uh, or say something, and we can uh, stop. And I'll certainly be happy to answer questions. So, so thanks. All right, like I said, I'll talk a little bit about my background, career, uh, and then uh, more on the uh, the TX slash T7 project, which is taking up most of my time uh, these days. So a little background, uh, I grew up uh, across the river over in Illinois, a little town called Teutopolis, Illinois, um, and I uh, went to the University of Illinois, a um, uh, big black guy up there. Uh, I was an electrical engineering student, and uh, uh, halfway through I joined uh, ROTC, uh, the Naval ROTC, um, and then uh, I graduated in 1984, and uh, upon uh, graduation I got commissioned at Ensign in the United States Navy. And I got selected for flight training, and I went down to uh, Pensacola, Florida to start my aviation uh, indoctrination, and then on to uh, primary uh, flight training. So the aviation indoctrination uh, is really, they teach you basics. Uh, really, first thing they want you to do is make sure you know how to swim, uh, all kinds of different <laughs> swimming tests. Um, and then they teach you land survival. They take you out in the middle of the woods uh, and leave you there for a couple days, and they teach you how to forage for food and how to make shelter. Um, and set traps for animals and stuff you can catch. Basically, you know, it's just how to survive uh, when you're out there. So if you get through that, uh, then you start your uh, basic uh, flight training. Um, and I did that down uh, by Pensacola. Um, I was in the VT-3 flying the uh, T-34 Charlie uh, Mentor. Um, that's in uh, Whiting Field, which is just north of uh, Pensacola. Um, that's kind of a quick course. I only got about 70 hours uh, in the T-34 on uh, basic aviation. Uh, once you finish that, then they basically select you in the Navy whether you're going to do a propeller-driven aircraft, um, a helicopter, or a jet aircraft. So most people want to fly jets. I did. I wanted to go high. I wanted to go fast. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to be selected for uh, uh, jet training. So. Uh, now the unfortunate news, I got picked to go down to Kingsville, Texas. Um, you can see the arrow in Kingsville. It's not marked on here, but it's, it's a couple hours uh, north of Brownsville, Texas, and uh, about an hour south of uh, Corpus Christi. Uh, and it's right on the coast, but uh, there's not much down there. Um, a lot of flat land, uh, cattle ranches. Um, so, uh, but it's a good place to go fly because there's nobody around there to, to be bothered with. So. Uh, and then down in uh, Kingsville, uh, flew the T2C uh, Buckeye. Um, you can see the top picture there. It's a straight-winged um, jet trainer. Um, it was a good introduction because you can see the straight wings. They kind of go slow, um, and you kind of acclimate to, uh, to jet aircraft. Um, once you complete that, um, went into the, uh, the A4 Skyhawk, which Chuck was telling me he um, uh, flew. So we made that a trainer uh, for the Navy in the 70s, 80s, and uh, into the 90s uh, before we got to the T-45. So uh, that airplane, uh, that's where we really taught you how to fly a uh, combat jet aircraft. So we practice uh, air combat maneuvering. Uh, they strap uh, little tiny dumb bombs on there. We learned how to drop bombs. Um, and uh, we also um, had to go to the, to the boat, so, or the carrier. But, um, so that's the big thing they teach you, uh, the jet aircraft. You got to land uh, in the back end of this. It so, uh, looks pretty daunting. Um, and the first time it kind of is. Uh, and if you look over here, they got the arrow pointed there. That's what we call the uh, Fresnel lens. And that's what's helping guide you uh, to land on the uh, aircraft carrier. So, um, 
And if you think this is hard, this is the daytime, this is when it's easiest. So when it's night and you can't see anything but lights, that's when it gets uh, even uh, more difficult. So, uh, um, But anyway, uh, you do 10 uh, carrier landings. Uh, if you do them successfully, um, then they uh, say you're good enough to uh, go to the fleet and you get your wings of gold. So and I completed that uh, back in February of 1986. So. Um, with that, uh, the good news was um, I knew I was going to leave Texas, I was going to go to the fleet um, and start uh, living my dream of uh, being a, a naval aviator. So, so I got selected for uh, the F-14 uh, Tomcat, so, which was exactly what I wanted. Um, it was a top line fighter at the time, um, and most people remember it from the movie Top Gun. Uh, but I actually got selected for F-14s uh, about three months before the first Top Gun movie came out. So. It was like everybody knew what I was flying uh, when I started flying it. So, um, and that's a picture of it going off um, uh, the carrier. The neat thing about the F-14 is you can see right now the wings are what we call spread, but uh, those flaps will come up and the wings, as you go faster, the wings sweep back to let it uh, go faster. So the faster you go, the faster you're going to go. So it was, a, it was built to go uh, basically a, a Mach 2 interceptor, and it was meant to protect the carrier, to go out long distances and shoot down any kind of Russian bombers that were going to come in and try to uh, blow up the aircraft carrier. So that was its main goal. We as fighter pilots uh, really used it more to do air combat maneuvering. That's what we like to do. So um, anyway, it was a very versatile airplane um, and it was a, a lot of fun to fly. So, so I get, get picked up for the F-14. Uh, I went to NAS Oceana, that's uh, in Virginia, and I was there uh, for five years. Um, and just Briefly, my different tours there, and we'll talk a little bit more what I did there in a sec. But uh, VF-101, the Grim Reapers, that's the training squadron at the time for the uh, the F-14. Uh, from there, after I uh, went through training, I went to the VF-74. They're called the Bold Bedevilers. Um, they're no longer in existence, but um, I spent uh, a little three and a half years uh, what we call the fleet squadron there. And that's uh, when I deployed on the uh, USS Saratoga um, with uh, Air Wing 17, a little bit more about that um, later. Uh, after I completed that, uh, I went back to a VF-101 as an instructor pilot. So, um, and I spent about two years there uh, instructing in the F-14 uh, A and B variants at that time, and then right before getting picked up for, uh, for test pilot school. Um, so. so it's just a shot of an F-14. You can see the wings are, are swept back. Uh, it's in the full AB, um, and it's uh, ready to go supersonic at that point. So, like I said, while I was at Oceana um, in the VF-74, uh, I did get selected to go to uh, Top Gun, or the uh, United States Naval uh, Fighter Weapons School. Uh, and that, that, at the time, that was out uh, in Miramar in San Diego. Um, and if you saw the first Top Gun movie, um, um, that's where they filmed that at. Um, now, the movie took a lot of liberties. It's not really how the course went. Um, yeah, there's really... That school, instead of a competition on who's the best, it's really how to work together as a team um, uh, to become an effective fighting force and they really to teach you uh, in-depth knowledge that you can take back to your squadron and teach them. So they're really teaching you to become a teacher to take that back to your squadron. And again, it's all about becoming an effective fighting force uh, and that's the goal of the, uh, the program. And it's still going on today. Um, and like I said, that's probably not... Uh, um, as, uh, as good as theme to make a movie out of, but uh, that's really what uh, the Top Gun's all about, and they do a very good job with it. So, uh, The picture on the left there, that's the uh, USS Saratoga, that's CV-60, that's uh, the air wing uh, was uh, deployed on um, when I was in VF-74. We went over to the Mediterranean um, uh, in uh, 87 and 88. So, um, and uh, while I was uh, on the, uh, the Saratoga, uh, we were in the Mediterranean, and at the time, you know, that was the late 80s, so, I mean, uh, you know, we did operations uh, off of Libya, uh, but we also had the opportunity to go uh, and fly, um, you know, in friendly exercises uh, against the Egyptian Air Force, um, and then we went right from there to fly against some Israeli Air Force uh, in Israel. Uh, and at the time, those two countries weren't exactly getting along all that well, and they really, they still don't. But. Um, so it was kind of neat to have that kind of experience uh, meeting and talking with the Egyptian uh, Air Force and then going over and doing the same thing as with the Israelis. So, um, uh, probably the, the biggest uh, memory of uh, that deployment um, was 
um, and some of you may or may not remember, but we did joint exercises a lot. Um, and um, uh, one of the pilots of my squadron, uh, we did a joint exercise. Uh, we had some Air Force F4s come in, um, and we were practicing uh, like we were uh, in combat conditions, and he ended up uh, rolling behind an F4. He was coming in on the carrier and and, and shot him down. So. Um, a Navy guy shot down an Air Force guy at that point. So, <laughs> now luckily, both uh, everybody lived, and we just lost the airplane. Um, but uh, that was a, a hard one to, for him to live down. So, uh. okay. Well, I was also on the carrier. Um, I was uh, what they call an landing signal officer, um, and I put this picture up because uh, what we call them LSO, they stand back there, and when every airplane comes in to land on board the boat, he's there. Uh, Basically, he's a safety observer. If he doesn't like what he sees, he can basically ask him to take it around, what we call a wave off. Hey, uh, it doesn't look good, doesn't look safe. Come back uh, around and try it again. Um, and then uh, every landing you do on a carrier is graded. So uh, they're always watching you for tendencies. And, you know, it's competition amongst the pilots, but it's really there for safety. If they see some unsafe tendencies or are always doing poor landings, they're going to set you down uh, and, and evaluate you. And if uh, you can't improve, uh, they're going to ask you, you know, you're not flying on an aircraft carrier anymore. So um, so that's their job. Uh, I put this picture up here. This is how they used to do it maybe back when Chuck was uh, flying. Uh, I'm just kidding, Chuck, but um, that's what they used to do. Uh, they used to have paddles, and that's all. Um, I talked about the Fresnel lens, but in the, before that, that's all they had for to, for a guy to guide. Um, somebody on board, board the boat was a the guy there with what they call paddles, uh, and they still call the LSOs paddles uh, as a nickname so uh, and uh, this picture on the bottom right that's an f9 and that's really the ultimate reason why an lso exists uh to prevent that that's a, a f9 uh, hitting the back of uh, the aircraft carrier so um, you know when i was deployed we had what we call a, a carrier air wing lso's they're kind of the the lead lso's and they instruct um, all the other squadron lso's to, to help them uh, aboard the boat but so there's two of them. That's their only job is to really make sure the air wing is flying safely on and off the boat. Um, and uh, we had one, the senior guy was getting ready to leave uh, to go to a, a different set of orders. Um, but the junior guy is going to take over. He kept uh, on his watch. There were three different instances where we call them uh, um, hook slaps where the, the hook of the aircraft carrier is right here. Uh, it was hitting the very back of the ship because the plane was getting so low. Uh, as it turns out, um, the, uh, you know, the CAG, the commander of the air group, um, uh, was concerned uh, that he was letting too many planes have unsafe approaches. So he ended up keeping the senior guy, said, hey, I know you want to go back home, but I need to keep you here. And the junior guy um, was asked, uh, basically he was reassigned because the, the commanding officer had lost confidence that he could safely bring the airplanes uh, back on board the boat. So um, let's see. Uh, this picture here is actually, and this is not me flying there, um, but um, you know, every once in a while they'll have air shows uh, around the uh, the aircraft carrier, just kind of a morale thing. And sometimes for foreign dignitaries on board the boat, they'll put on air shows just to show off uh, what carrier aviation can do. Um, and you can see that you know, he's pretty low; his bottom wing tips uh, below the carrier deck. So, um, yeah, yeah. carrier deck's about 50 feet above the water. So. And, and he's he's going about 350 knots at that time, so he's going pretty fast. Okay, um, so like I said, after I uh, completed my instructor tour, I got picked up for uh, for test pilot school. Uh, and uh, the U.S. Navy uh, is up in Patuxent River, Maryland, and it's about a year course. Uh, and that's where they basically teach you a lot of aerodynamics, what makes airplanes fly, but also the human machine interface of what makes it easier for a pilot to perform his mission. Uh, and in the military, you know, we fly the airplanes, but the ultimate goal is to employ weapons um, to, uh, you know, to defeat the enemy. So, um, and so we get a lot of that, and uh, they bring in a lot of different airplanes. Uh, and if you hear about test pilots, they'll talk about how many different airplanes they've flown. And a lot of it starts uh, right there at test pilot school. They try to bring in them as many different kind of airplanes as they can to have you fly them and evaluate them and uh, understand uh, what makes something a better airplane uh, from a bad airplane. And hopefully you'll incorporate that um, into future designs as you go through your career. So, 
So after I graduated uh, from Tesla Poly School, I got sent out to uh, VX4. Um, it's called the Evaluators. That's in uh, Point Magoo, California. Um, it's all the way, so went all the way across the uh, country to the West Coast. Uh, and that base is just north of, uh, really, Malibu, California, north of uh, L.A. It's, uh, it's, it's a pretty area. So I did um, a lot of operational test and evaluation there, uh, and that really involves, uh, once something's fully developed, uh, we would take it and we would de de uh, figure out the best way to employ it, um, whether it's a bomb, a missile, uh, and then uh, relay that information to the fleet so they could effectively employ the weapons. So, um, while I was there, uh, that's an F-14, that's a Phoenix missile being shot, so we did a lot of missile shots, and uh, to the right there's an F-14D, which is the latest variant of the F-14, and uh, we got to evaluate uh, that as well. Um, while I was there, I uh, went up to Edwards Air Force Base, that's an X-31 um, uh, experimental airplane uh, that had what we call thrust vectoring, so they used the little paddles in the back for the nozzles to actually move the airplane left and right. Um, uh, which was a, a leap in technology uh, at the time. So they incorporated that. Uh, you see the, um, the F-22 uh, has that, at least in the, in the, uh, the vertical. So, uh, And then uh, I started flying the F-18 um, while I was at uh, VX-4 too. So the F-14 at that point was starting to get phased out. The F-18 and the Super Hornet were, were coming online at that point. So. Okay, from there... Um, I uh, went up to the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Um, the Navy um, one of their test pilots uh, to be educated as well, so I got my master's degree um, in astronautical engineering. Um, I got out of there in 1997. Uh, it was while there I really realized I really missed being air, uh, flying airplanes. So um, Monterey is a beautiful place, um, and I was getting paid to go to school, but uh, I really missed being around airplanes. So when I Time came up for orders. I really pushed uh, to try to get back in the, into the cockpit. And, and fortunate, uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to do that. So I, um, I went down to uh, St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, I was part of uh, the Defense Contract Management Agency down there. Um, uh, they oversaw the uh, Northrop Grumman Corporation, who were remanufacturing re some F-14s uh, uh, and some F-5s uh, that I was uh, lucky enough to be a, a part of. So. And then when I was there, we stood up um, uh, another group that was remanufacturing F-18s, and that was up uh, at Cecil Field in Jacksonville, which was a retired uh, naval base that um, they started leasing out hangars space to, to different contractors. So, uh, and from there, I went up to, uh, the, to St. Louis uh, as part of the DCMA up there. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Uh, so... Uh, Top left, that's an F-5, and that's uh, what we're remodding down in uh, St. Augustine, um, as well as the F-14 uh, in the top right there. Um, and then uh, when I went to St. Louis, I originally started flying the F-18 and then the T-45 uh, Charlie. Um, I was an pilot, acceptance pilot for the Navy, um, doing both of those airplanes. Um, and then uh, in 2004, I retired, and I was fortunate enough to uh, get hired by Boeing as an uh, experimental test pilot. So, and um, as you can see, started doing uh, F-18s uh, and F-15s, and uh, as well as T-45s. So, um, I have a few more pictures here on the next slide. So, T-45, that's the Navy trainer, uh, and that's what uh, Bob was the chief engineer when I started working with him. And uh, that's the picture of the very last uh, T-45 made um, in the top left, and that's, uh, we're delivering that down to NES Kingsville. So, and that production closed out line in 2009, I think, Bob, we, we closed that, so. Uh, so. But um, in the interim, uh, that's when I, uh, Started flying the F-15 as well as the F-18 um, at the time. Um, uh, I put this picture here on the bottom left. Um, we had a lot of dignitaries, but uh, President Trump did come through, uh, and I was asked to sit in the cockpit and uh, talk to him about the uh, the F-18. So, uh, which I did. Uh, it was a little funny story. The uh, so the, I mean, um, the security people uh, were very adamant that. Uh, 
I could not let him sit in the cockpit because that was an ejection seat and that was dangerous. <laughs> so, uh, and that's why they made me, I, I sat in there. Uh, but I did ask him, I said, well, I mean, if he asked me to sit in it, what do you want me to do? I'm not going to tell him no. And you're going to have to come up and stop him yourself. So, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but fortunately, he didn't ask. So but, uh, he, was, uh, he was interested, uh, and uh, especially uh, parts of uh, being a carrier-capable aircraft and uh, everything that it could do. So um, um, yeah, it, was, it was a good visit. So, uh, the picture on the right is uh, the TX trainer, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, that's us. Uh, uh, on the second flight of uh, T-1, uh, taking an airborne here over St. Louis. Uh, these are just some pictures of different testing that I've done as an experimental pilot um, at Boeing. Um, uh, you know, the, the top pictures are F-15, so um, when I first started flying the, uh, the F-15, uh, we were uh, building airplanes to uh, deliver them to uh, the Republic of Korea. So they had bought the F-15 and we were in charge of the testing. We actually had to deliver them over to Korea uh, as well. It was uh, not a, uh, what we call a, a military contract. It was a commercial deal that the uh, United States government had approved, but it was up to us to do all the uh, flight testing and deliver it over to Korea so the U.S. Air Force wasn't involved uh, in any of the testing of it. So. Uh, the top left is a picture of us, uh, and that is me refueling. Uh, that's uh, San Francisco um, uh, below us. Uh, that's the Golden Gate Bridge going across the, the bay there. Uh, and then to the right, that's a picture of us flying uh, by uh, Wake Island, um, going across the Pacific uh, uh, into Korea. So, um, so we did that probably a, a dozen times to get out of the airplanes over there. Yes, Chuck. To deliver those to Korea, did you fly them over or did you send them over on a carrier? We flew them over. So. Flew them over. Yep, yeah, that's us refueling there, and we're on our way to Hawaii. Uh, we'd go to Hawaii um, and then land to take them, and then from there we'd go to Guam, um, and then from Guam uh, into Korea. So. Um. Uh, I always find it interesting to note that Japan would not let us overfly their country with uh, Korean F-15, so they made us go around. So. Um, as much as I say it, I still think those two countries don't like each other. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. so. uh, this is a picture, you can see this, this is a missile, uh, an AIM-9 uh, heat-seeking missile that just got launched off uh, an F-15, um, that was part of our testing there. We were going uh, just... Uh, about Mach 0.95 when we launched that uh, missile. That was one of the test points we had to show that we could safely launch it uh, at those kind of air speeds. So. Uh, and then on the right, that's just uh, another air show picture that was uh, back down um, in uh, Lima, Malaysia, um, going down there for air shows. So um, I was fortunate um, flying F-18s, uh, and we don't participate in the International Air Show with F-18s uh, right now, but um, Got to fly the Farm Bar, the Paris Air Show, and a lot of other international air shows with the F-18. So. All right, so so this is a, a picture of our TX. You see, yeah, we're going uh, by downtown uh, St. Louis. And the interesting story in, on this uh, picture is that the, our photographer, and I don't know if you knew Kevin Flynn, Bob, but. Um, he was always the guy we'd go to to, hey, we want to get a flyback picture of the arch. What do we need to do? And, you know, he's, you know he'd tell us the altitudes, how the space is. And he's always very adamant. You have to do it in the morning because if, I, um, if you wait till the afternoon, the sun angle is just going to wash everything out. So, um, lo and behold, we had this set up. Uh, and this is actually the first time both those airplanes were airborne at the same time. Um, yeah, but uh, the morning was really foggy and we couldn't fly. Uh, it was like... We had to wait, so and by noon it finally burned off. Of course, the photographer's like, ah, oh, it's, it's not going to work. The sun angle's going to be bad, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, we have to try it um, because we got things lined up. We had the photographers, and, you know, for the other, the, the chase airplanes, um, and, uh, and and we did. And so and this is the picture. It worked out really well, I thought. So so, so he was wrong, <laughs> wrong for a change. Uh, and and uh, you're right. Um, it worked out, and, and actually this picture was uh, on the uh, Boeing annual report th for that year um, in uh, uh, 2016. So uh, I'm up in the uh, lead airplane there and we did a couple of passes back and forth so we got different angles and, and I actually thought we're kind of heading southwest uh, at this one and from the cockpit this 
this angle I thought looked the worst. I thought it was better going to the northeast, but the pictures, um, you know, don't lie. I mean, this actually turned out uh, fairly well. So, uh, but in any case, so, uh, so the T7 um, or TX, it was a program the Air Force uh, for a replacement for their advanced jet tactical trainer. So um, they were thinking they were looking for an off-the-shelf uh, product, something that could get quick. Um, but, you know, when we started talking about doing a, a clean sheet, clean bill, they said, well, you can do it, but, I mean, this is going to be a tight timeline, um, and you're going to have to build, um, we're going to demand that you provide us what your plane can do as far as um, your turn rate, your Gs, um, uh, your speeds, uh, angle of attack, uh, performance characteristics, stuff like that. So you're going to have to build some airplanes and get this test data uh, to submit to us uh, as part of the competition. So. Uh, and so that's what we did. I mean, we looked at it, um, we partnered with Saab, um, and uh, we incorporate a lot of, you know, modern digital engineering techniques. Um, we're working with Saab, who's half a world away in Sweden. Uh, we're trading designs back and forth. They're building the back end, we're building the front end. Uh, we bring them together, uh, and, you know, they, they come together almost like Legos. Uh, it was pretty amazing. So, um, and I always say, I mean, in the design part, I thought, um, you know, we were uh, probably about six weeks behind, uh, and I didn't think um, we were going to make our schedule because we had set the goal we wanted to fly by the end of 2016, uh, and that was our time and to make um, <clears throat> to make it <clears throat> the flyer test program and get the, all the data we needed for the proposal. We needed to fly by the end of 2016, and. Uh, we were working hard, but uh, we were still behind schedule, and I didn't think uh, we were going to make it. Uh, but um, when that AF section came in from Sweden, uh, and we made it at, um, with the front end that we made at Boeing, uh, it was it was seamless, and we made up like three weeks right there wow. on the schedule because it went together so much uh, better than what normal or uh, you know traditionally airplane manufacturing techniques would come together. So. <clears throat> So uh, to do it, I mean, we actually had to do what we call low risk. We kind of looked uh, what was out there, what was already developed that we could use. So we borrowed, um, you know, the Saab Gripen. We used a lot of their secondary power systems to come over. We used a lot of F-18 components. Um, and actually we used some components off the, uh, the T-50, which is a Korean trainer, which is one of our competitors. Uh, we used uh, some of their actuators uh, as, as well. So anything that was what we call flat qualified that we could just basically take off the shelf, put it um, in the airplane, you don't have to go through a lot of qualification testing. Um, you know, we could uh, cut, uh, basically cut a lot of time out of the development of the, uh, the aircraft. So uh, this is a busy chart and I apologize, but this is just the different requirements that we were going to have to meet uh, and the data we're going to have to collect um, to uh, submit with our proposal. Um, we also designed it not just for operational uh, ability, but for maintainability as well. So we had maintainers coming in, so because this airplane is a trainer, it's going to fly, you know, three times a day. You got to be able, if it has a problem, be able to fix it and then fix it fast. And so we did a lot of design uh, trade-offs to make sure that uh, the maintainers could really uh, keep this airplane going. Oops. Excuse me. There you go. All right. So uh, we didn't make our timeline. Uh, we did our first flight on 20 December uh, 2016, um, and it went so well that uh, we flew it again the very next day, uh, which is really unusual for a, a, a brand new aircraft. You'll fly it first time. The engineers want to look at the data. They want to analyze it. They want to make sure it's good before you take the next step. Um, we had, um, like I said, such a clean flight. We came back and we talked about it uh, that afternoon. And um, the engineers all gave us thumbs up, said, yeah, let's take it back up, um, and, uh, and we did. So as you can see, you know, we're flying uh, in the wintertime in St. Louis, so weather's always a factor, too. And part of it's like we knew we had some good weather coming, and we wanted to try to take advantage of it. So, uh, so we did the second flight uh, the very next day on 21 December. Um, uh, the big thing there is on the first flight, uh, we kept the, uh, the gear down. Uh, and did um, checked out all of all the different systems uh, and make sure things were safe and we could safely recover the aircraft if something went wrong. So the next flight, uh, the big thing there, we went back uh, up in the air and this time for the first time we put the gear up and, and put it back down and make sure that functionality uh, works as well. So at that point we were off and running uh, on the test program. So 
Um, it was really about a six-month program. Uh, we finished up all our data collecting uh, by June of 2017, and um, we packaged it up and then sent it off to the Air Force. Um, and this is a picture of the cockpit, um, and you can see it's a lot of glass, so we try to take as many switches out of the area cockpit as we can. Um, it is truly an electric aircraft, so if you don't um, have any electric power, the airplane's not going to fly. You need the flight control computers, you need, a, you know, we've got uh, a couple generators and uh, some battery backups there to, to uh, keep the plane flying uh, as long as possible, but with no electricity, th th this airplane is not going to fly. So. So you can see, um, Chuck, we took the uh, center stick out, and it's a side stick um, type controller, and uh, that just seems to be the wave of the future, uh, and that's what most modern fighters uh, implement these days. So, so uh, this is a video of um, the first flight takeoff. Uh, let me see if I can go back. Sorry. Here we go. Sorry. So that's a view from the uh, half cockpit. Um, we actually had a camera mounted in there and uh, it's so a kind of a 360 camera, had a lot of good footage uh, out of that one. And then, uh, let's see, the, oh, let's go to the next, oh, okay, back, let's take off. Okay, this is the uh, coming back to, uh, to land. We uh, did the first flight uh, out of Lambert Field, um, and we did a little coordination with the FAA because first flight, unproven airplane, they don't want you crashing into a school, hospital, or residential areas, so we had to map out um, a special corridor, how we were going to take off, and we had one specific runway we were going to take off, and basically to the northwest, we were going to get over the uh, Missouri River and go north. Uh, and just follow the river, and it just opens up where it's un, you know unha uninhabited area there. And then coming back, we had to do the same thing. So we we took off uh, going to the northwest, and we had when we came back, we had to land um, to the southeast on the uh, on that runway. So uh, which meant wind wise, you know, we always like to take off into the wind. We had to have a fairly calm wind day, uh, so we could uh, we could do that uh, type of exercise. But uh, but we did, and and it worked out. So. Um, and also, uh, let's see what's next. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, anyway, this is a picture of Bob and I uh, in South Africa in 2007, I think. So, um, you see, I'm telling Bob all the things that engineers do wrong uh, with the airplane. So, but anyway, to finish up uh, the T7 story, you know, we packaged up that proposal, uh, and uh, you know, in 2018, we were announced we won the, uh, the proposal, and um, so. We're in the midst of what we call engineering manufacturing test phase of the uh, of the program now, um, and we're starting the low rate production, which means starting to build airplanes uh, for the Air Force should be uh, late next year. So, um, but anyway, so that's my presentation. Uh, questions? Anybody have any questions? Yeah. First of all, we'll yeah. Yeah. I got, I got a, an observation: all the things that you did, all the time that you spent. You're a lot older than I thought you were. Are you about 104 now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Not quite that old. Okay. <laughs> I don't yes. have a question. I have a comment. Yes. I feel like I I know all about flight now. I just finished reading the autobiography of the Bright, Bright Brothers. Oh. And going back to Kitty Hawk huh? to here, it's like... Yeah. It was amazing. No, I agree. The oh. progress we have in just yeah. like 100 years yeah. uh, is impressive. Yes? On the takeoff, the short field, is that designed strictly for aircraft carrier takeoff? 
What's that? The, the shark deal take off. When you say the plane takes off, it takes off into a, a shark deal. Oh, uh, no. And actually, uh, the, you know, the, you're talking about the T-7 that we yeah. just took off? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's that's not meant for the carrier, that oh. that airplane. So, But it, it's it got a lot, we, what we call, a lot of excess power, so it can take off really quickly, that airplane does. It's got a lot of performance to it. So, um, on the, um, so sure. anyway. What's a typical lifespan of an aircraft such as that? Good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the, the training aircraft, the T-7, um, it, it, we're starting out about 8,000 hours on the lifespan, so that's probably going to be about 20, 25 years, but um, we expect it to go longer than that. As You know, the T-38, which would, it's replacing, I mean, that thing first flew in 1958, and... Um, it's still going to be flying, you know, by the time they totally phase it out by 2030, so. Um, is the B-52 bomber still in service? It is. So, yeah, yeah. it's another great example. So, um, they can keep, you know, the engineers find ways to replace structure and uh, keep those airframes flying uh, well past what they're originally designed uh, to do, so. Yes? I noticed on the landing, you were only landing on the, the back Two wheels. Why wouldn't you land on Correct. the front? Um, for the, uh, the forces on the, uh, the gear, you want to keep it on the main gear. They're stressed to take it, uh, and you want to cushion the landing. Um, and it's if you try to do a three-point, what we call a three-point landing, uh, you're pretty flat and fast, and okay. uh, the airplane's not made to uh, take it like that. Okay. So, Back. yes? Wouldn't you have a military exercise with the other country? What kind of a language do you use? Um, <clears throat> well, the, uh, for aviation, the uh, international language is English, so everybody who flies in airplanes will speak English, uh, as well as the controllers. Now, sometimes it's hard to understand with, uh, you know, with their accent uh, what exactly they're saying, um, but, but everybody's familiar with uh, the English uh, if you're flying airplanes. Sure. Yes? Air Force came out with a new bomber. Yes. Um, and it said it can be either manned or unmanned. Right? Now, I, it was my understanding that the Navy, the Pax River, also went through that exercise and even put unmanned aircraft landing on aircraft carriers. Correct. There's uh, and actually Boeing's building. It's called the MQ-25, which is a uh, un, and it, it's not manned at all. It's totally unmanned um, uh, airplane, and uh, it's um, designed to land on the carrier, um, take off and land on the carrier um, without a pilot. So, and that's been in the work. I mean, companies that technology almost the last 20, 25 years. They've been pushing that and. The military, both the Air Force and Navy, have been trying to figure out how to implement that, um, and it's going slower, I think, than a lot of people thought. But it's getting there. The uh, I think the Navy's taking the right approach. They're not trying to say we're building a combat airplane. That MQ-25 is going to be for <clears throat> reconnaissance and refueling. Um, that's what they're saying first. But obviously, that the platform can grow into different uses. Um, but uh, that's the initial take from what the Navy's trying to do, which is. Probably smart, in my opinion, is you kind of integrate that uh, with the manned aircraft. Um, but, um, <clears throat> but you know, make no doubt, I mean, we're pushing more and more to unmanned aircraft um, just because you take, you know, the, uh, a human being out of harm's way if you're going to try to attack something. So, but, you know, what we're also doing, um, you'll see, we basically we call them <clears throat> kind of loyal wingmen is the name of the program, but it's uh, airplanes can carry these unmanned little airplanes under the wing and deploy them. And, uh, you know, they got sensors on them. They can take them out there and they can, you know, get data from that, uh, you know, a little unmanned aircraft back to the, uh, to the, to their, to their aircraft and they can use it like, you know, as a wingman. He's got another set of sensors and he can feed that into uh, his own sensors uh, to help him uh, paint that picture of the battlefield. So. So there's a lot of use, I guess, the bottom line is a lot of use coming with uh, unmanned type of vehicles. So, so I can, uh, 
How much computer power is on a aircraft that you're flying or designing? A lot, yeah. I mean, we have obviously our flight control computers, which uh, we need to use to help uh, fly the airplane and monitor all of our systems, whether it's hydraulics, uh, fuel, um, uh, the engine for propulsion. Um, but then there's the mission computer um, that handles all the processing. And, and they put a lot of power on it. To it. You're talk, I mean, especially if you're trying to employ air-to-ground weapons, I mean, they'll put you know, all these uh, databases with you know, all the terrain features and stuff um, that they've built around so they help, can, can help target a weapon. So um, um, there's just, you know, I don't know what to compare it to, but there's a lot of computing power put into the airplanes. And they, you know, they, we you know, build a new mission computer, um, that's a constant process trying to get more capability into the airplane. Isn't it fun to see somebody who's ex as excited about his work today as he was 50 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once a pilot, uh, always a pilot. pilot yeah. So, I, 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 last question. He was 50 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am, so I. You okay? <laughs> Got her? Go ahead. Uh, did you personally experience any uh, any crashes? And if you did, how did you maneuver, how did you maneuver, maneuver yourself out of this storm? Um. You know, I've lost some engines airborne. I had some, you know, flight control malfunctions, um, but um, nothing that was what I consider out of the ordinary. The, the biggest issue I had, um, I had an engine catch on fire one time when I was on a ground roll. It was an F-14 out of Oceana, and I was just going into afterburner, um, start the takeoff roll. Uh, and actually, a destructor pilot at the time, and the guy in the back was his very first ride in the F-14. He was a <laughs> weapon system officer. So I got about to uh, 80, 90 knots, and I got a fire light. Um, and, uh, and that normally tells you you got a fire inside the engine compartment. Um, and so, um, you know, I boarded the takeoff, pulled the, you know, throttles back, started braking. But I look at my mirrors, and the whole back part of my airplane's uh, on fire. You know, it's in flames. And I'm thinking, I'm sitting on 16,000 pounds of fuel here. Um, I, you know... The taxiway came up, I was able to turn uh, and stop the aircraft, uh, and then we, um, we saved up our ejection seats and we did an emergency egress, basically climbed out um, from the cockpit and jumped to the ground and, and, uh, and got away from the aircraft. And luckily the fire department, the, uh, you know, they're always on call on, on the military airplanes, they, you know, they saw the flames and uh, by the time I had stopped the airplane and, and gotten away from it, they were already spraying the foam on the aircraft and put the fire out. Um, and they had asked me if I had uh, shut the fuel off to the engine. That's one of our, you know, uh, merge procedure steps. And, and I had, and I couldn't figure out why that whole back part of the airplane was on fire. But what had happened, one of the fan blades for the engine um, had uh, basically had come loose. Um, it had gone through a remanufacturing and they had ground too much off on the, on the, uh, the root of the blade. And it started vibrating and it finally vibrated enough where it just tore loose from the engine. And it went through the, uh, the engine compartment and punctured one of the uh, fuel tanks. And that's what was letting all the fuel um, basically come out uh, and over the airplane and, and start the fire. So We're going to have to cut it off at this point. And I want to say a very sincere thank you very much. I'm a oh. fellow pilot, all right. but not as the degree you are. <laughs> okay. It was wonderful. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.